to run that if it's the um, other lines that has a short rail, they probably use that that power. I'm not pretty sure, but they um, I think for the air condition they have a separate engine for that. And anyhow, but railroad cars that transport food, they have a dedicated generator for the uh, same as the truck dedicated system for the refrigeration and again it's designed to um, store for transport not to reduce temperature but to maintain temperature okay it's not a <clears throat> it's not a system where you put in hot stuff and expect to do a hot pull down and that being said guess what if I put the um, if I'm using one of these systems, which is what type of metering device you think they will have on that? Automatic expansion. Yeah, right into that. Yeah, that's that's logic, right? Yeah. yeah. Automatic expansion valve they will use on any system that's there to maintain, maintain. not pull down. Mm -hmm. Okay, not reduce. So, um, now in this region. Negative 50 degrees, negative 40 degrees. This is really the temperature range where this, they pack frozen food. <clears throat> and all of this packaging has to be done automatically, guys. People cannot work in this kind of temperature. All right? Only in Alaska, not <laughs> because they're forced to live here. But here, uh, the unions ain't gonna allow you, OSHA won't allow you, Department of Labor won't allow you to work in that kind of condition. Only idiots like me who decide to do refrigeration has to work and fix the box under these conditions. Because <clears throat> when you have something like two tons of food going through a cooler and a spiral conveyor, and this, something goes wrong with that conveyor system in there, you gotta rush it. Be hanging inside here, you know. Throw all the food at you. No, you have to fix it so you can get the food out of there and uh -huh. get keep the packaging line going. You can't, you know, if you stop one, if you have a packaging mile with um, two miles of conveyor system, it's two mile of conveyor system. You shut it down, mm -hmm. and their workers at each different station you have to stop. We'll have to stop and wait. You see, your downtime is not just machinery downtime, it's production downtime. So you lose, it's unacceptable. You need to go in there, get it fixed, get it fixed pronto. Right. <coughs> These here, they do it in stages. There is no one, um, for this kind of production system, there is no one compressor that's going to do it. And you typically we have these in a um, machine room and then pipe the refrigerant to the evaporator coils. Something uh, pretty close, almost like how supermarket rack systems are set up so that we have compressors that are gonna pull the temperature down from high, from room temperature because like maybe negative 10, negative 20. Then you have another system that will go bring it down to negative 40, and then a, another system bring it down to like negative 50. Cascading, cascading <laughs> Very much like a cascading system. But in this case, it's stages, all right? We may have one compressor here, and let's say this is a two-stage system, because remember, I told you this goes to negative 20 pretty easily, right? Mm -hmm. So the discharge from the negative 20 compressor goes into the suction of the compressor that's supposed to bring me down to negative 50. Negative 50. All right? Actually, something like that, but we'll see how it works, right? And uh, you guys are familiar with compression ratios, right? Mm -hmm. For them to build a compressor that's gonna run with that kind of compression ratio, negative 50 to 200 and um, 
78, 280 PSI, which is about 130, 25 degrees. All right, you see the temperature difference, mm -hmm. all right? The temperature here is practically zero. The pressure here is practically zero. Mm -hmm. My compression ratio becomes 270 something to one. If you really look at it, yeah. you know? So <coughs> it's pretty tough to go from, to climb that hill yeah. with one compressor. So, so you put it in stages. So two stage for this application, stage one to bring down the box to the stage two to bring it down to that, and this is how it works. Oh, wait, 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 I want to go back. Yeah. All right. Have well, you ever heard of Dex, uh, Dex I didn't get any of that. Just got it up. Which one you didn't get any of? Mr. Ramdes, have you ever heard of a Dextron? Compressor? Dextron, yeah. It's a whole unit for an indoor pool, spa. It looks Not, like it's see. making use of the, of, the, of, the, of the pool. It's like a heat sink. Oh no, that's a heat pump. Yeah, it's a heat pump. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like the model is it's, called. It's, a, it's, is it Dextron or? Um, it's a Drytron, but they call it. The this model is a Dextron three. Oh, well, what that is is a heat pump, right? And the application, the, the application is pretty popular in Florida where they use a heat pump to heat the swimming pool. Yeah, that's what this is. In okay. Florida. Yes. Yeah. Why would you Why would you heat a swimming pool in Florida? Indoor. Yeah. Oh, indoor. Well, this is no, an indoor pool. You have to because the water temperature. You may not realize this, but very rare would you find water temperatures the same as the air temperature. There's always a ten to fifteen degrees yeah. difference. Right, but it still feels warm as hell. When <coughs> you're any temperature, any water temperature that's below your body temperature gets you hypothermia. Well, I'm just, just saying, any time I went in the water in Florida, it felt like I was coming out of a bathtub. Yes, but how long can you spend in it without oh, oh. getting hypothermia? You, you will. You may not know it. You're going to feel any significant effect like if you drop in the bear and see. Right. But you do get hypothermia if you spend over an hour in the water, even out here on the island where you when it, in the middle of summer when it gets to 72 degrees, you are going to suffer from hypothermia right. because there's a 20 yeah. degree difference. Yeah. Right. So you need to you need to heat up the water at least to body temperature and up and a 100, 100 and, um, 105, 110 degrees is like a comfort zone for your body. You're not going to get hypothermia because that 110 degrees is 10 degrees greater than your body temperature. And if you notice that 10 degrees, we carry that 10 degrees in everything in this industry. 10 degrees temperature difference, 10 degrees difference between here and here out, you carry it because it's more or less what you have as to compared to your comfort zone and uh, operating zone. So even though the compressor, the receiver, and the, the uh, <coughs> indoor coil was in the pool room, you know, it was using the way it looked like to me is they were using either the, the heat pump to heat the pool or vice versa, something to pull them. It, do, it can do two things. Yeah. The heat pump, the heat you, um, if the water out This pool is hot, like, really hot. Well, yeah, some people like it like a spa. That's what the water is really. All right? So you can bring that temperature because your typical, um, on a 95 degree day, let's say the water in your pool is, uh, what this did you is say? 85. 85. 85. Yeah. You're looking at a 10 degree difference, you bring it right up to 95, which is body temperature practically. Yeah. Right. And you can get it higher, because the higher the water temperature is, and you have that 20 degree temperature difference, the higher the more heat is going to generate, especially if I am especially when the condenser unit is piped outdoor, the evaporator unit is piped outdoor, it's gonna be a couple ton load of heat yeah, that's to dump the, it into that pool. That's what they yes. have. In the yeah. case of using that for pool heating, they do not pipe the evaporator unit into the structure. They don't use it for cooling. They just dump that air. They dig it from outside. Come on, people in Florida are rich. This is not <laughs> part of this Oyster Bay, no. which is also rich. Oyster Bay is also rich. These yes. people were rich. They had big iron yeah, gates. Um, they were rich. That's 
But they're gonna rip it out. They want. They say it's too much electricity. Waste of bank. Yeah, waste of bank. And they're worried about electric. They got a friggin' So energy. here's how this yeah, works, guys. Remember <laughs> this is I am. This is my negative fifty, right? It comes in here. It pumps up. Uh, it's at a 278 psi. I will bring the discharge pressure to maybe 150 psi. Then I pump that 150 psi into the suction of this, and this will bring it up another 50 or so. And see that this is three compressors, and I'm close to 300 psi. Each of them bring it up 100 psi more. So when I end here, I end up with my 300 PSI, G, PSI A, and my suction pressure here is almost zero. Is almost zero, but look at that. I didn't go for one shot. I just climbed that hill in stages. <laughs> I had rest points, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. like that. So, so it's not so much strain on the one. So there's no strain on any one compressor <coughs> in this system. <coughs> and these, for these system guys, oil return very critical because at negative 50, your oil does not want to flow. No, you can see the oil Right? On the side. So the, see this is an oil level right. yeah. float flow. and monitor. So it, um, where, unless you work in a, in a food manufacturing plant that that packages food for um, resale, you're not gonna see this. If you work in a bakery, you'll see this, and their compressors are like 75, 100 horsepower, 150 horsepower, and they'll have different compressors, and all of them will be piped up there. Like this, actually it's gonna take you like a week to figure out which pipe goes where. But eventually you will. All right. So, in a system like this, um, we will have <clears throat> what we call a. You will have a receiver in this, always, because it is low temperature. You will have a, a, a suction accumulator. You will have a receiver. And believe it or not, with this system, to make it a little bit more complicated, this liquid that comes back from here, we will take and pump it into the liquid line off of the receiver. So, remember um, we were talking about li liquid amplification some time ago with the supermarket when you go into a defrost, instead of bringing that liquid back and then putting it into this accumulator and have it boil off and the compressor pump it, we take that liquid and pump it straight into the liquid line and back into all the work evaporators. Yeah. Well, you evaporator. Same thing here. Else. Yeah. So you just bypass everything else and get back. Yes. In. We yeah, take the liquid uh, because it is liquid already, and that's what we want. It, that's what the condenser does. And there's a lot of it, right? Yeah. And it's cold. It's already subcooled. So it's really subcooled. And I put it here with this hot 125 degrees. So if I have two gallon at 125 and two gallon at negative 50, you're gonna lower the temperature. Guess what? Negative 75 divided by 2 is 40 something degrees. Uh, so you yes. So I right just so cool by about 40 odd degrees. Even which put me right in that 45 degrees range that I need. So you see how the sub cooling, how we can use this system to get that 45 degrees of cooling. And the more, the colder you can get the liquid going to the metering device. Mm -hmm. The colder it's going to boil off. The, the more yes, heat energy it can absorb. Oh, wow. That's right. what it takes the, the BTUs to live. Yes. Right? So the colder the liquid, the more BTUs it can take before it, it, it will boil. Yeah, okay. Same as water, right? If you start with water at zero degrees, it takes a lot more BTU to bring it to boil than if you start it at 80 degrees. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. So you got to chop for the energy. And, you know, like I told you before, in this industry, <laughs> All we're concerned with is transferring BTUs, heat energy. Either we remove it from in this room or we bring it into this room. 
nothing more, nothing less. All right, and that changes the temperature. So that's the two things we work with. Use the heat energy, transfer heat energy, interchange them to give us a certain temperature. So bottom line is what I'm trying to reinforce again is that you don't necessarily have to have a service gauge, manifold gauge set. And don't don't think pressure is everything. Alright? It's not when you read the pressure it's just so that you can translate that into temperature. Because the pressure gauge don't tell you nothing else other than if you have positive or negative pressure and how much pressure you have in the system. It does not tell you how much refrigerant is in the system, no way. But, you know, but if, you, if, you take, if you take temperature, you get translated to pressure, right? Well, no, if you take temperatures, right, you don't even need to translate it into pressure. Because here's the deal. You work out if I want to see negative 50 degree here, mm -hmm. and 278, um, which would be 125 degree here. Now your gate will show you, if it's 22, your gate will show you um, 278 PSIG here, right? Your gate may show you just below zero degree, zero PSIG here. Because um, R22 at atmospheric points at negative 41. So this may be just below zero, and this is for um, reference, because this would typically be 404. Okay, so now that's zero, that's 278. I still have to go to the pressure temperature chart to find out what temperature that is. But if I put my thermometer here, thermometer here, and I get 125 there, I get negative 50 there, I don't even have to translate that into pressure. Because I, yes, I'm dealing with temperatures. So you can right? make a charge on the temperature. So, we're not dealing with pressures really. The pressures is what help us to translate it into temperature. Okay. All right. So important. If you go out there and you're serious about this industry, <coughs> and you buy your electrical tester, the DMM, get a f either a field piece with all the additions. Well, the Aspen. The Aspen. Field piece aspirin. It's the brand that the yeah. gauges that have the superheat. They do have. No, everything. field piece has electric. Yeah, the electric meter. Yeah. And they have. And the here's electric the deal. Meter that takes off the top. Yeah, fluke. You know they make the best instrument. Right. Mm -hmm. But they're like twice the price of field piece. So I suggest you guys t buy the field piece. They're good. I've, you, I've been using field piece, um, my meters are like 12 years old. See, I called you field piece. And I just bought they're still field there. Piece. Yeah, I know, I was telling you. They I can compare it to any brand new fluke right now and the readings are gonna be exact. Yeah. Yeah. Bottom line is, oh, you gotta clear it. I take care of my tools. Yeah. You got a little speck of dust in the wrong place, I wipe it off. Even if I have to do this and wipe it off, I do it, you know? So, I want to do now, one electrical meter can check <clears throat> amperage, voltage, capacitance, it can check um, Price, resistance, it check diodes, it check temperature, it check um, pressure transducers. You can check down. pressure because now you can get all the pieces now that attach with the same leads you take the that you can take different readings. How about microns? Also yes, if you buy the if you buy the um, the piece the attachment piece that you attach with the holes, it's gonna translate well, my, that and read microns too. My gauge is a built-in micron. Yeah. Zero so they have ninety-nine to five thousand. They have um meters that would do one meter that would do everything, but you have to buy the attachments. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And <coughs> field piece. That's what I want. Field piece um, is good, guys. Buy it. How much? The base meter in a case. I bought the meter in the case. Um, you know what? At the break, I'm going to call the supply house and because um, there's Aspen, there's, there's Aspen two, Aspen three, and Aspen four. Yeah, I, I haven't followed up in 
get it later, see yeah. later because my old meat is running okay. Now this is the gauge. Yeah, they last, last, last forever. They last forever. This is the gauge. The gauge is that they got. I know that. I know that. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So did you get the ice maker running? I, I got um, one of them is running, the, the, the one with the fancy door that the guys built. Okay. That one is running. The one that's at night project on the No. The one that's right up next to the sink. Oh. When you go in the lab, it's up against the wall. That one is running. We had it making it. Nice. The other one, I'm going to get the number off of it and call United and see if they have a um, power in stock and I'll go pick it up and get it running probably this afternoon. So tomorrow morning, you guys get it. But I have the chiller thing running. Last night there was the glycogen. Yeah. yeah. So we can go take a look at it later. Actually, um, I'm going to tell Mr. Compton to have you guys. All you need to do is go to the back of the, you see the plug, the, the yeah. wire, the extension with the plug on it, and plug it into the outlet under. And on the right hand side of the little box, there's a plug at the side. You have to plug in the pump. The pump. Yeah. Do not cut off that for anything because there is a plug on the machine itself. Because what that, what that allows us to do is stop the pump from running and work on the refrigeration side of the machine and see how it chills the water without having it circulating, without putting unnecessary load on the system. So it allows me to service the two halves of the system separately. Okay, this is just the example of the, I don't know why they put it, so. So this is how the stages work, and I just break it down. <coughs> the fourth stage will be this here coming in, okay? Second stage is not going to be that, it's going to be here. Okay, very low compression ratio of 4.79. If you look at that, do you remember um, compression ratio of an air condition system, air condition compressor, so somewhere in that general region? You guys, yeah, it is. Five to one. Four, four to one, four five. To one five to one. That's the general area, and you know, air conditioning compressors at that ratio, they don't really have to. They're not working on any kind of significant load. Yeah. You know, so it, at this point, this behaves like an air conditioning system. Right? It does it. That's energy and everything. And then here, this pressure, I'm going to pump into the suction side of the auto. So this gives me my low, very low temperature, <coughs> and then I raise the air pressure, which is um, which is this going into the suction and that. So it's going to be a 10 degree di to 15 degrees um, difference in in um, PSI, yeah, which is Average. suction saturated. Right, and then it raises it to the final stage where I need to bring the vapor up to get it to change back into liquid. And that's how you're getting your so that's where I go up. from negative 50 to room temperature operation and back down to negative 50. But I do it with two compressors, two systems. But the, the discharge manifold is connected. Yes, if you look at this, mm -hmm. suction, suction discharge <coughs> into that, right? Yeah. So it's all connected then basically into... Yes, you see that? Mm -hmm. So this suction discharge into suction discharge into the... So the discharge of this one is really the suction... Of yes. Okay. Yeah. okay. Because the discharge of this is practically the same suction pressure as an air condition unit, if you notice, right? Yes, mm -hmm. within the same general area. Right. Dependent so, on the area. there'll be a little variation. Now it's going to be sucked into there and brought. Yeah, then it's going to go into that, 
and bring up the area where you can condense the gas now. Because in order to <clears throat> change that vapor into liquid, you need to bring that, raise the temperature above room temperature or ambient, and then cool it down. So it can condense. So it can condense. To put it back from the middle of the room, let me finish that up with That? Yes, sir. Ah, oh, I have a suggestion for you. Let me find out the price of a little camera, too. Now he has one, but he has one, but I just, uh, I'm getting this from him. I'm going to double up anyway. But yeah, the same answer. Yes, sir, you can. Yeah. Damn, I said, I'm getting it from Dan. It's practicing writing. It's practicing writing. Yeah. Can't write too good. Yeah. Up again, so I thought you had to recover again. That's because they screwed it up. So I go there and I see that the initial charge is 19 pounds, but the full charge is 40, 45 pounds, and they added more than that. And I said, I, I can't take all this at once, so I'm gonna have to come back and you're gonna have to. Oh, by the way, double. can you guys explain the difference? Yeah, you're in you're in atmosphere it's pressure, right? To it. Yeah, 14. 14. <laughs> Because anytime, anytime you do these calculations involving temperature and pressure, you have to take them to absolute values. That's these calculations you and bring it back to. That's the only age. way you can get your compression ratios yes. in the atmosphere. You want to draw this? Yeah. This is in a book. Yeah. And it looks a little bit more colorful. Than a thing. I think it's break ten now, right? I can't draw yeah. for sure, bro. I can trace the hell out of the paper. Is that Dex <laughs> on that? I can't draw for sure. Whatever the hell that was doing, it was really cool. Turn on the light. 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 Turn on Thank <laughs> you. 